Hey guys, it's Michael. Welcome back to my YouTube channel and welcome to a new video in video two of the Weighted Calisthenics programming series. And today we have a pretty interesting topic about RPEs. What are RPEs and why the hell do we need RPEs? And this is what we're gonna find out in this video today. At first, we're gonna clarify what RPEs actually are. RPE stands for Rate of Perceived Exertion. And it is basically a scale that is used in strength sports to rate the subjective effort of a set. So to rate the relative intensity of a set and how heavy that felt. Not how heavy the actual load on the bar was, but how heavy it felt moving it for X reps. And there you use a scale from zero to 10 and we're gonna take a few examples out of this scale. We have the RPE 10, which is the top of the scale. And if you rate a set with RPE 10, that means that set was max effort. You can't do a single additional rep. You can't do uh, one kg more, really max effort. That was the best that you could do on that certain day. Going down on the scale, we're ending up with RPE 9 meaning you roughly have one rep in the tank. That does not need to be very precise with that roughly run rep, but from the feeling here, you could have done more. You could possibly have done one more repetition with the same weight. And that goes down. So RP8 equals roughly two reps in reserve. So you had roughly two reps in the tank for that set. And RP7, you had roughly three reps in reserve going all the way down to RP0 which was kind of like no effort at all, or at least super, super low effort. Between those RPEs, there is always a range when we would rate it in percentage of one rep max, meaning that something can be heavier than RPE 9, but it can also be lighter than RPE 10. If you're more advanced, uh, you can use like RPEs as 9.5 or 8.5 because you have usually, depending on the lift, depending on the lifter, something as three to 5% one rep max um, difference, like the percentage. So here you're talking about 100% and on RPE 9, for some it's 95%, for others it's 97%. That differs a bit. So if you have a set at 98% one rep max. So if you dip 100 kg and you do 98, um, then you're not training at RPE 10, but you also couldn't do one more rep and then you're somewhere in the middle. Um, just so you know that these are really just um, subjective measurements that you can use to rate the effort. And now the main question is, why the hell should we leave reps in the tank? Why the hell should we care about measuring the subjective effort for a set? And to find that out, we're gonna take a look at SRA curves. As you now learned lots and lots and lots about programming, it can be quite overwhelming and quite confusing. To bring some light into the dark, make sure to schedule your free consulting call for our online coaching because we have a lot of experience with all that stuff. We know how to write the programs, we know how to bring all this theory together, put it into practice to really make sure that you get the best possible program for the best possible results for your individual case. So don't wait, schedule a free consulting call for our coaching service and we make it happen. So to further dive into the concept of using RPEs, we need to understand another concept first. And this is the model of SRA curves, meaning stimulus recovery and adaptation curves. And this is important to understand because each training stimulus that you get in will create responses for your muscles, for your soft tissue, for your nervous system. And those responses differ depending on the stimulus you provide to your body, so how you train, and also how often you train and how intense you train. And those SRA curves can help to really model those different responses for the different tissues and the different systems in our body. And later on, we will learn how we can 
balance those responses to train more effectively over time with the help of RPEs. So don't think this is too far uh, beyond what you wanna know. This is actually the foundation that you need to understand <clears throat> and that you need to really have um, just like a real understanding about to make sure that you can use RPEs in an efficient way. So let's take a look at this graph here. We have performance on this axis and we have time on this axis. Now, this point here is stimulus. So we have a training session. Depending on how heavy that session is, depending on how intense that session is, we're gonna get a homeostatic disruption. So systems are getting disturbed and so they need to adapt over time. How does these adaption processes look like? After this homeostatic disruption, due to that training stimulus, there is a recovery process. So the system needs to heal, going back into homeostasis, and then the adaption occurs. So over time, the system adapts to get better prepared for the next upcoming stimulus. And that is how training works. You really give your body a training stimulus, so you disrupt homeostatic, then over the process of recovery and adaption, you reach a higher performance level. So far, so easy. But those SRA curves, they look different for different systems and different tissues in our body, and they are different for different stimuluses that we provide. So let's take a look at the nervous system. As we covered in the first video, um, motor skill is very, very important for one rep max strength training. So we want to force a lot of nervous system adaption to get higher one rep max performance. And we have several responses that we can get. We can get more force output and we can get better technique. Both those outcomes here on the performance require a different stimulus and they also require different recovery times. And this is where stuff can get complicated. So let's take a look at that. If we want to increase our force output, then we have, mm, let me draw that with a different color. Um, we have, long recovery. Why do we have long recovery? Because we provided a very, very heavy and intense stimulus. So in order to get stronger and really force adaption in force output, we're gonna train very, very heavy and we're gonna have a wait, or we need to wait a very long time so that this adaption can occur. That means we cannot do that very often because if we start to get a second stimulus in somewhere here on a lower performance level, we will get a decreasing SRA curve and we don't want to do that. So we can do that like once, maybe, maybe twice a week, depending on the lift and the intensity, even lower. So more towards the side of once a week. Um, for some lifters that are very, very strong, it could be even every second week or lower. So if we wanna create adaption in our force output, we can do that once a week and we need very, very long recovery because of that. If we want to force technique adaption, that is an SRA curve that is pretty responsive because you don't need a lot of stimulus. Like you can uh, force uh, technique adaptions with um, very, very little weight, just going repetitive through the movement. So here we have fast recovery and we can do that basically every day, but let's say three to five times a week, depending on how heavy, how intense the stimulus is, you can train technique up to every day, but you know, three to five times is a good orientation. Then we have the same thing for a hypertrophy response. If you want your muscle to grow, 
you need to provide a certain stimulus on a certain intensity that we covered also in the first video. So here we have, depending on how big the stimulus is, we have like medium long recovery. So let's like medium recovery. So you can train that, let's say two to four times a week again, depending on how big that stimulus is. The bigger the stimulus, the longer that time till adaptation takes because the homeostatic disruption is bigger, so recovery takes longer and so on. But somewhere in that range we are. So if we're training for hypertrophy, we can do that like two to four times a week. And then the last thing that is very, very important is the soft tissue integrity. With every training that we provide, we destroy certain tissues. And soft tissue integrity, once it's destroyed and uh, you know disrupted, then it takes very, very, very long to heal and to really get back into that adaption. So here, with those soft tissue integrity, what we need to really force recovery and adaption is we need times of lighter training. So this is something that really accumulates over time. And to make sure that recovery happens, we need times of lighter training in the form of a no load or a deload. And that is also the reason why um, athletes that only train hypertrophy also need some deloads from time to time, even though they do not train for force output and so they don't have those big, big, big stimuluses in case of absolute load. So soft tissue integrity, um, the responses really add up over time and so you create a big homeostatic disruption and so the recovery times are pretty long. And now the challenge for us is how are we gonna bring those together? And the solution for that is called load management via RPEs. Let's now put what you've learned to a test with this example. We're gonna take a look at the program here for dips. Just super, super basic as it just should show you how you can work with those SR8 curves and what you can learn from that. What we wanna do is we're gonna take a look at this program here and then we're gonna rate from not optimal to optimal how those SRA curves interact with each other and then find out if that system is something you should use, if it's sustainable and if it's something that gets you results. So we have Monday session, three singles on the dips at an RPE. 10, so max effort, all the singles, heaviest you can do go. And we have uh, Thursday at three times three, also at an RP10, so heaviest you can do. So pretty extreme example for you. If we take a look at the force output, we are training very, very specific to create force output. So um, there's a very, very high chance that this session here provides a very, very good stimulus to really create a homeostatic disruption to then lead to a pretty high adaptation response for our force output. If we take a look at the second session, seeing this is also super heavy, then it could be that we are providing that session when we are still within that part here in time. So we are still in that recovery phase. And depending on where we are, it can still make sense, but it might be too early to provide a second that heavy session because performance is not increasing yet in a way that we can really feel that we got better. Wrong side. Gonna get back to this one here. So when we're looking at not optimal to optimal hmm, for force output, somewhere here, probably a bit more to the optimal range because we're really providing um, 
good stimulus um, and we're training it twice a week. So it might be too early to get to that second heavy session here, meaning we're definitely not optimal, but we're also not not optimal because we're training specific. Good. If we take a look at technique, let's make that a bit bigger. If we're gonna take a look at technique, stuff gets different. We just have two sessions a week, totaling nine and three. So 12 repetitions over the whole week, all super heavy. So there is no chance to really focus on technique. We are definitely somewhere here in the not optimal range. If we take a look at hypertrophy, um, we're training at muscular failure, so that's good. But we are just training very, very little workload and we're training very, very little volume with those six sets. So also here more towards the not optimal end. If we're looking at soft tissue integrity, we need to zoom out a bit because, you know, with two of those sessions, you don't, you know, interrupt the, um, the soft tissue integrity too much. But if you do that for two weeks, then there's already a pretty, pretty great response. Meaning that if you train like this, there's a very high chance that you need time of that load pretty fast. So if you're training always that heavy, you need to have a lot of time off heavy load also to make sure that recovery can be happening here. So also here, this is too intense to make sure that you can train sustainable over a longer period of time without no loads or deload. So also here, not really optimal. As the volume is pretty low, it's not on the lowest edge, but not very optimal. Second example, and this time the other extreme. We're still training dips, we're still training it twice a week. This time we go with a Monday session, three times eight repetition, also max effort, and a Thursday session with also three sets, 10 repetitions at maximum effort. So what you can call a pretty bodybuilding orientated style of training, so pretty hypertrophy driven. We're going max effort, we're going with more moderate um, rep ranges, so higher rep ranges, causing the absolute load on the belt being a bit lower. And now let's take a look at our S or A coils and how they interact with each other and if that's um, an optimal setup to really reach our goal of getting stronger over time, so increasing one rep max, or if it's not too optimal. If we take a look at the force output, we see that it's super unspecific training. Um, it's not zero because also sets of eight, if you're doing them heavy as we do here in sets of 10, if you do them heavy, will stimulate um, an adaptation and force output, but it's very little. So we are more towards the not optimal range here. Technique, we have a lot of repetitions over the course of a week due to the high rep ranges and the first couple of reps, we can definitely be very, very focused. Um, frequency might be a bit, a bit low to really practice that much, but it's definitely not, not optimal. So we're more towards that side here. So that works. If we're looking at hypertrophy, of course, we're now not covering assistance exercises. We still only have six sets, but let's consider those six sets in this case uh, a bit, you know, something that works for this particular athlete. We're definitely also more in the range closer towards optimal because, um, yeah, we're definitely um, accumulating a lot of workload with those sets here. So there will be a good stimulus and we're also not training too heavy. So there is sufficient recovery time if we do that twice a week. So also adaptation works. So for hypertrophy, very, very simplified, this is okay. And then we have the soft tissue integrity as you're just training those uh, two times per week, moderate loads, but very close to failure. We're somewhere in the middle here. So you can do that for sure for a couple of weeks without needing to deload, but um, still 
not optimal as it's very, very close to failure. So the last couple of repetitions, if you're a like, really strong athlete, can cause uh, a lot of damage there if you do that over a period of a couple of weeks. So if we're looking at that example, we are really getting those three curves here good together. So technique, hypertrophy, and soft tissue integrity. This works pretty good together in this plan, but our actually goal to really increase the force output works just very, very poorly. So we need to find a way to organize all of these curves in a way that they work together over a sufficient period of time so that we can create a good force output, that we can make sure that we increase our technique, that we do that while in the best case, not losing our muscle or even building up muscle and not destroying our soft tissue integrity, meaning that we will have phases of training where we train light enough so that our body can heal. And at this point, I'm gonna disappoint you. This is something that we're going to cover in the next video.